I'm no different than you. <laughs> okay, maybe some ways, because we're all a little bit different, but in one way, I'm no different than you. Just a few minutes ago, I sat down and I, I said, you know, Lord, what do you want me to share and care and relate? What do you want me to talk about? What do you want me to speak? You know, as though it were coming from you to inspire someone to walk after you and to know you in a more personal, intimate way than they possibly have known before. Or maybe, you know, just to kind of like encourage them. And so the Lord told me and I came out and I shared a message on you're not welcome. And it's kind of like one of those things where you know, you got to get the right timing together with the right place, you know, and just because you do the right thing doesn't mean you're in the right time and place, and so you got to kind of coordinate all this stuff together by doing and asking God to lead you, <laughs> you know, and so it's kind of like, it was a pretty good message, you know, it's like, it was really inspiring, I mean, I was listening, sort of, you know, as I'm kind of like told people, I hear what's being said, and I kind of go, wow, the Lord's really doing a number, you know, it's cool, you know. It was fun, you know, I enjoyed it. It was like, man, I got done, I went, well, that was pretty cool, you know. And, and uh was looking forward to hearing it, you know. And my wife had been down there, you know, reading her Bible, and people walk by, you know, and sometimes they hear snippets or passages of it, little parts of it. So I was going, well, praise the Lord, you know, because I was thinking, well, that's, you know, God doing his thing, you know. And so I got done, you know, and I, I went into the, as I often do with video, I got done recording, and, you know, I, uh, my... My camera is a logic tech, you know, kind of like orbit sphere, you know, it has this little red you know, eyelet, you know, on the side that tells me the camera's functioning. But just because the camera has a little red eyelet doesn't mean it's recording. <laughs> so when I got inside, after 20 minutes or so, I don't know how long it was, of uh, sharing and, you know, reading the Word of God, you know, and mentioning that too, it didn't record. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to hit record. Just like you, see? I'm just like you. <laughs> I, you know, laughed and I wrote a little piece, you know, that's on the internet, you know, said something about, oh, 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 and talked about how exciting it was, you know, the message and all that stuff. And I said, oops, down at the bottom of it, I forgot to hit record. <laughs> you know, I mean, God does that. You know, I don't, I don't run around going, oh no, the devil got it, you know, he done destroyed something wonderful that just got all boogied. <laughs> no, you know, I'm sorry. When you're going along, you know, and, and you kind of enjoying what you're doing and God is blessing you, you know, even though I'll admit my back is like really, you know, having that kind of like bad back attack. Um, when you're still enjoying it anyways, you know, and you kind of like relating, you know, the things that God has done, and you're having fun, you know, you really are doing it. Even if it doesn't get recorded, it gets heard. It gets somehow communicated. Because one of the things that I learned as a baby Christian was that if I stood up and preached inside of an empty church, I'd still be preaching to angels in heaven, thousands of them, myriads of them, it would be recorded, my words, they would stand out as a testimony to what I am and a witness to the generations to come of what I was and who God is. Because lots of times that's where people make the mistake of thinking that what you see is all there is. Well, you know, I look around, I don't see anybody sitting in that church, it's empty. Well, no it's not. You see, we're told in the scriptures that angels watch day and night examining the things that man is doing and how God is dealing with man. Because men, we're told, will judge the angels. I'm going, oh really? <laughs> not me, man. <laughs> Pass that one off to someone else who could judge righteously. Because I'm not. But the point is, the scripture says, you know, the angels look in on the things that men are doing. Because... I'm sure they're dumbfounded by how we get away with what we do. Because I don't think they can do what we can do or get away with what we do because they operate under a different venue and different means. I suspect their frame of reference and their thinking is different too. 
and so is ours. Of course, we're told we only use a portion of our brain. <laughs> there you go. Okay, maybe the rest of it's comprehension or capability of seeing the spiritual dimension. You know, kind of like dogs can see more than we can. You know, they have a higher spectrum of light available to them that they can see with, and they hear better than we hear. Maybe that's why that donkey could see that angel. Maybe, maybe some of the animals in the animal kingdom really know more than we do. Wow, wouldn't that be a shock if we were at the bottom of the, the spectrum instead of the top? <laughs> Oops, maybe that's the curse. <laughs> Our brain dead, you know. The man that sold sins that shall surely die. He went brain dead, you know. Okay, although we tend to teach that it's spiritually dead, it could be brain dead too. We're walking around brain dead. <laughs> but my point being is that though we do not see all that goes on around us, we can still have that assurance that nothing that God has done is ever wasted. We see in the physical reality of just the world we live in how everything has a purpose and a plan. It's being used in some way. It, if you want to say recycles, it recycles itself. Nothing disappears or is brought out of existence into existence and goes back out of existence. Everything seems to break down to their atomic structure and then back into some other structure. They recombent structures. They reconnect in different ways. And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to reconnect with us in a different way. He wants to cause us and our DNA and our RNA as well as our very atomic structure to become less so connected to the physical realm as the spiritual realm. So that's why he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Because so much more is going on where we can't see than what we can see. So that's why I didn't feel all shook up or you know, took up with emotional response to, oops, I didn't record it, <laughs> dummy. <laughs> if anything, I did what I always do. <laughs> I laughed about it. I thought it was funny. You know, because, hey, I, I know within my heart that somewhere in some part of the universe, you know, God uses it. God's not wasteful of your time, energy, your efforts, your intentions, nor your perspective. God is interested in every detail of your life. A lot of people don't realize that and they try to argue that, you know, God's got no time for you. They try to say, well, he's so big or he's so whatever that, you know, you're not that important. And yet, the Bible says every hair on your head is counted. I don't know about you, but I don't think you're as consumed with your hair, no matter who you are. Even if you're a woman, you know, like really getting styled, you know, and compiled and, you know, all the ways that you do, you arrange your hair. I don't think you count every hair on your head. <laughs> I don't see you checking out like a CSI, you know, kind of like looking at your comb to find every single little hair that might have fallen out, you know, in the shower or, you know, in your comb or, you know, who knows where else. We're not that consumed with our own every detail, but God is. God, as the Creator, is so aware of all that we are that He cares about everything we do. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your path. In every way, shape, and form that we do not treat with respect, God treats as an object of His visible manifestation of Himself. You are His workmanship, created not just for good works, but because you are the good work. You see, that's the part that people get mistaken. They get into like a works trip, rather than the trip being they are the work. <laughs> yeah, you are. You, as a workmanship of God, has been developed to be the example of God to a generation that you live in. The people around you are observing you and watching you to see what you'll do. You know, one of the things that I think, you know, like maybe some Ray Comfort kind of like confrontational thing is wrong or some of these other people that get into, you know, confronting people, you know, maybe off the wall, is that the world really isn't looking to confront and be convinced by confrontation some way of finding God. 
No, they want to watch you and see if it's true. Because that's what usually happens is that somebody, you know, they'll say, yeah, you, well, yeah, you're a Christian, but, you know, well, I'm going to keep my eye on you because you're wacko too, you know. <laughs> and they want to see if there's a difference between you and what you do as opposed to what they and they do. Now, I'll admit, you know, if I was going to look for a perfect Christian example of some kind of what I think of as a Christian lifestyle, I might look at maybe, you know, Quakers or maybe they're not called Quakers, maybe they're Amish. Amish or Mormons or, you know, some other religious zealous person that has a zeal for good works, but maybe not so personal a knowledge of God. They might, don't get me wrong, some of them might know God personally, you know, they just chose to, you know, be very strict about how they live their life. Kind of puritanical, you know, like the Puritans. And that might work for them for a little while. But even the Puritans, who kind of like came to America, after a while they were killing Christians and calling them witches because they didn't like what they were doing or didn't agree with what their ideas were. That's kind of a little bit not quite what Jesus said. <laughs> Although they did get a little extreme about it. And so, what we realize in that knowledge that God gives us as we grow with Him is that everyone has a value. Everyone is looking for the reason to believe in there being a creator of the universe. Everyone is looking for an answer to the questions of why God made this whole big blue marble mess that we live in and why things happen the way they do. Everyone really wants to know that, but they want to see if it's true what you say as opposed to what someone else has said. And they're just really trying to figure it out. Oh, it may come across as the confrontation that you see or you experience, but underneath it all, if you don't react to it, you'll find that the more confrontational a person is, the closer they are to finding the truth. Often, God can deal with a person that's on fire against him. Then he can deal with someone who says they're for him and are lukewarm and do nothing about him. That's just the way it is. So, don't ever think that God isn't interested in every little detail of your life, whether it be a successful recording or a seemingly accidental misrecording or not recording of some message or some thing you thought you were going to do, you know, like when I wanted to get saved, you know, I didn't get there the day I wanted to, or when you have a plan and your plans go awry or askew and don't happen the way you want them to, remember, God is in control. We used to sing it a lot and I used to love it because it really is true. He's got the whole world in his hands. Whether you know it or not, whether you see it or not, whether you understand a hurricane blasting through your house and knocking and blowing your house down, or a tornado, or you know your your personal life falling apart, God's got the whole world in His hands, you know. And He didn't promise you you'd understand it. He did promise you that He would help you, that He would reveal Himself to you, and that you could know Him in a personal way. What I find in my life, and I've been through some personal devastations. Boy, have I! is that those circumstances never changed my perspective of God. They never rearranged how much I knew He loved me. Because though at the time I may have feared or struggled or challenged or sinned or whatever it may have been that I've done in my life through those circumstances, I always knew my Father in Heaven loved me. I always knew in my heart of hearts, he was doing the best for me. I always knew sometimes it was a consequence of my own actions, mostly. But I never changed who he is because I had changed what I was experiencing at the time. Because God changes not. Once he's said who he is, that's it. And God said he is love. So you can argue, debate, confront, Treat as though it were not true that every hair on your head is counted or 
that he's doing recombinant DNA structuring to teach you about the kingdom of God and the things you can't see, how important they are, as opposed to the things you can see, which you really can't see much of what you think you can see, because after all, a dog can see more than you can, and a dog can hear more than you can, which kind of means that maybe you should be led around by a seeing eye dog and a seeing hear dog. <laughs> uh, which is why we have spiritual, not advisors, but we have those who have gone before us to teach us the way to study to show ourselves approved, the workmen and need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, so that we would understand and comprehend the mysteries. They're not like unfathomable. Mysteries just means you have to unravel them. You know, you you kind of watch a good mystery and you see at the end the good guy wins. <laughs> you know, and they do sometimes. But you know, a mystery just means that you got to put the pieces together. And that's kind of what you do with your life. You got to put all the pieces together. Once you do, then it's not a mystery. But as we have those who have inspired us to pursue the mysteries of the universe or the mysteries of God, and as they become more obvious to us, then we know by way of our personal relationship with God who He is, how He operates, and why He has done some of the things He's done, at least as much as we understand Him the way we understand Him. If so be the Lord be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out. As the Lord said. You know, I always like that last part. You know, I, some people go, well, you know, I, I'm going to name it, claim it. Well, if the Lord said, then go do it. Well, I'm going to, you know, just have enough faith to believe. Well, if the Lord said, then do it. I have an expression that I use a lot in this ministry, and it's, it says, whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. Now, I know because, you know, I deal with pastors. You know, the first thing a pastor does with that one is that they're, oh, but it can't contradict Scripture. So, well, you know, everything contradicts Scripture somewhere. I mean, technically, from volume to volume, it all fits. But I can take something from Genesis that's going to contradict something from Revelation and to put it by, they contradict on first observation. So, it's not really true that you kind of like have to prove, you know, whether or not it fits according to Scripture. What you really have to do is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding, because if you're trying to prove constantly over and over again, well, I gotta have a word on it. Well, you know, even worshiping a word on it sometimes will lead you worshiping the word more than the Lord. And Satan quoted the scriptures, so. It is about your personal relationship with God, even as it was with Jesus. When Jesus was tempted of the devil, it wasn't like the devil came to him and told him something that was contrary to the word of God. No, he, he took portions of scripture and he used them to challenge Jesus. Because technically what he said was true, but applicably it did not apply to God the Son in that person of who he was at that point in time in being the suffering servant. Because God would reveal himself later as being the Son of God in the end times when Satan himself would be cast down and Satan or Jesus wouldn't even bother with him. But there was that temptation time when he was in the flesh of his body that God had prepared for him, that if he could have been tempted and failed, then he would have been. And yet he succeeded. And how? The Lord and the Word of God. So, in my mind, I've always told people, whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do, and to go to God. And then, if God's telling you, you'll be responsible to God for it. Someone comes up and says, you know, well, what if God tells you to kill someone? Well, first of all, I would seriously have a long talk with God about it, you know. <laughs> and I'd probably have a serious issue with it, you know. But the bottom line is, now you're, I know someone's going to go, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. Well, yeah, you know, if God told you to go do it, go do it, fool. You know, I mean, I can tell you this. If God tells you to kill someone and you do it, you're going to go to court for murder. You're going to be processed for murder. And you're going to stand before God to try to explain to him why God supposedly told you to murder someone. I don't see it. I don't believe it for me. I don't question if you tried it. I would stop you, but hey, you know, I wouldn't doubt that if you want to keep talking till the day you die and stand before Jesus Christ himself and say, the Lord told me, okay, 
you know? And that's what I do. Is that in a lot of things where people tell me some really weird things that they say the Lord told them, if they tell me the Lord told them, I back away. Hey, I don't know. You tell me the Lord told you, I'll walk away. And I'll say, okay. Now, you can tell me the Lord told you to tell me, and I'll go, well, thank you. And I'll go and ask the Lord. Because, no offense, you know, I appreciate him telling you, but he can tell me just as easily. You know? So I'll go check it out, you know, for me. But everyone should prove all things, you know, and don't be deceived because sometimes men deceive themselves. So that's why pastors say, you know, be careful when you tell someone whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do, because Joseph Smith claims to have heard from an angel. Well, okay. At least he was factual. And I have no doubt that he heard from an angel. Morona. And some people say, if you're a moron, follow Moroni. You know, because I'm moron. <laughs> I follow Moroni. But, hey... Paul warned us if even an angel of light appears, you know, and he preaches any other gospel, don't follow him. Well, you know, okay. If God comes to me and tells me to do something that I don't feel is scriptural, I'm going to negotiate. You see, I've learned that about my relationship with God. I can sit down like Abraham and Lot or Joseph, Joseph, not Joseph, uh, Abraham or Lot or Moses and talk to God to ask questions and discuss it with him. That's where I say, what the Lord tells you to do, you should do, is because you have the opportunity, and God is not some big bad meanie that's going to say, do it or else. No, he allows for us to discuss with him his will, to choose to obey or not, to operate according to grace in his sight. So if I found grace and favor in your sight, O oh Lord, then let me ask one question. If there be ten righteous men would you destroy the city for the ten, you know, and let the ten die with them? No, not for ten. Oh, but if there's any one. And you know the story. So, be less careful as much as you think you need to be. But today, if you hear his voice, as the provocation says, harden not your heart. You don't need to keep running to the Bible to check and see if that God speaking to you is God speaking to you. What you probably need to do is to say, Oh, like Samuel. Yes, Lord, here am I. Because even Samuel had an issue. He said, Samuel? Uh, he runs to Eli and shakes him and wakes him and says, What do you want? Eli says, I don't want anything. Go to bed. And he goes back to bed, you know. Samuel, you know. Samuel? I mean, I'm sure it was just a soft spoken, normal voice. It wasn't like some kind of so say Samuel, you know, or some weird, you know, Hollywoodish type of speaking to him. But Samuel, Samuel goes, I don't know, you know, Eli, you playing a game on me? Shakes him up and says, What do you want? And Eli says, I don't want anything. And they do it a few times, you know, and then finally Eli says, Why are you waking me? He says, Because you, somebody keeps saying Samuel. And he says, Well, next time you hear a voice, you know, that says Samuel, say, Speak, Lord, thy servant listeneth, or something like that, you know. Here, Lord, am I, you know. What? <laughs> I mean, but yeah, bottom line is, you're you and I'm me, so whatever you get, you know, from the Lord, then, you know, answer. And so Samuel did, and by golly, guess what? God spoke to Samuel. Oh, you mean he didn't have to read the Torah in order to follow the words of the Torah? Well, no, but Samuel checked out, you know, to make sure that it was kind of like, you know, not Eli playing a trick on him. You know, I don't think you're going to get punked when God speaks to you, in other words. You're not going to have some, you know, am I on can to camera kind of routine. No, God doesn't make a big deal out of how he speaks. He just speaks to you because he loves you. He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I hear so many times people mad at me, arguing with me, furious at me, because I say, You know, if you got the Lord, you don't need a gun. And they go, Oh, but I have the right and the might and the power, and the privilege, and the constitutional 
Amendment, and by golly, God said I could have a gun. Well, you know, God said you could do whatever you want to do, too. He says, you know, go for it. You know, you've got grace. All things are lawful to you, but not all things are profitable. And so, you know, yeah, you could keep a gun around, you know, and you could let someone else steal it from you, or someone else use it, or you might abuse it. You might get mad at one moment and kind of like flesh out and shoot someone, maybe even shoot yourself, you know. And in the violent times we live in, if you really choose to be a violent person, you could go out and do that. But you know, I learned something very early on when it came to David. David had the opportunity to be a man of God, a man with God, or a man for God. And sometimes he was for God as he stood up and he threw a rock. And the rock dropped Goliath. And he was a man for God because he was like for the nation Israel. You know, by golly, we're not going to let God, you know, his name be smirked by some, you know, giant out there mouthing off, you know, and saying what he said. You know, so David, you know, jumped up and volunteered. And at times David was a man of God when, you know, God would inspire him with these beautiful psalms and he was laying there, you know, just meditating on, wow, Lord, you're so wonderful, you know, and I just love you and the stars in the sky are not compared to what you and I or what you are and how much I love you. And he wrote the psalms, you know, based a lot upon, you know, his personal time with God. Even when he was in trouble, in his personal time he wrote psalms, which was kind of interesting, you know, he was still talking to God. Remember that. You know, but and a man with God was times where he didn't necessarily do what was right, but you know, he did lots of things that were wrong, but God was with him anyways, whether he knew it or not. You know, like slobbering in front of one of the kings and you know, and acting crazy in front of another one and being like one pastor told me a terrorist, which I thought, no, that was David, you know. Or, you know, committing murder, you know, in order to get the woman he wanted, you know. Imagine that. So Lots of times we forget that God, irregardless of what we think, you know, that we need to protect ourselves or our reputation, that we need to somehow, you know, confront the situation, that we need to have, you know, our weaponry, you know, <laughs> got to get, you know, not just a handgun, we better get, you know, an AK-47 because someone else may have a, you know, a 12, 12 a 9, may have a double Glock, you know, whatever, I don't even know right now. My mind is running with this. May have an Uzi, well, we need a bazooka. Well, they got a bazooka, we need a bigger bomb, you know. I mean, doesn't that get stupid after a while? You know, well, we better have our cameras, we better have our locks, our security, we better put our trust in man and his inventions because we can't trust in the Lord, you know. God knows, you know, someone might steal our physical possessions, you know. Jesus said something very interesting. He says, don't fear what man can do to you, but rather fear him who after killing the body can condemn the soul to hell. That's what Jesus said. That's the person you should fear. So fear God, but don't fear what man can do. I mean, what are you going to do? Save your life in order to lose it? Or rather, if you lost your life, would you not find salvation? I mean, really, if you're a Christian, what are you worried about? You're saved. You're going to heaven. Who cares if they kill you? Better to die as a testimony and a martyr of a witness to God than to die killing someone or stealing their opportunity for salvation by condemning them to eternal damnation. I mean, phooey. You really think a gun is going to protect you when the Lord said he would? Sorry. God might say, hey, you got a gun. Go for it. See how well that works out for you. You know, I don't see God saying that, but lots of times that's what I feel like telling people. Like, hey, you know, the Lord says, you know, if you put your trust in the arm of Egypt, you know, then let Egypt be your deliverer. But I am the Lord your God. Trust in me. And Israel didn't. They tried to trust in Egypt, and they got shipped off into Babylon. They got shipped off to different places until they learned to trust in the Lord. Maybe your gun's going to teach you that one. But the sooner you get rid of it, that's a good demonstration of realization of trusting in the Lord. I don't care if someone breaks into your house or someone stands there or someone, you know, rapes your children or, you know, rapes your wife or whatever, some stupid idea people come up with. You know, if you trust in the Lord, He directs your path. God didn't ever said that you would not have to go through some 
miserable, trying, disgusting, you know, crucifixion things. If anything, he said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, because if they so persecuted the master, will they not likewise do so to the servant? Yes, you likely are going to die. I will? Well, yeah, you're a human being. Guess what? You know, you don't get to pick and choose how you die. God does, you know. Frankly, you know, even a rapture is a death, but, you know, the point being is that, hey, everyone dies. The soul that surely sins, the soul that sins shall surely die. Everyone's going to experience some type of death. The question is, how well do you want to face it? How fearful are you of it? What is your realization of knowing God in a personal way? The work of righteousness. I will not fear what man shall do unto me, for the work of righteousness is manifest. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of yours only. The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Stand having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand the Lord is with you go in this thy might the Lord God has never told us to go out and slay, murder, kill, and destroy. Christian wars have been started by supposedly God telling them to go. Christian army men, you know, go out and play army games. Christian police officers, you know, God bless them, you know, but, you know, they have to deal with their own issues. They that live by the sword should die by the sword, you know, and if God's told them to be police officers, they operate according to the will of God and the mercy and grace of God. I personally know that there are lots of Christian police officers that I know will not necessarily kill rather than protect. They will protect rather than kill. They choose to operate according to their daily walk with God and their daily talk with Him. Some, sometimes, choose to step out of that vocation to make an avocation into a profession of faith by doing something else like missionary work or going into possibly being you know pastors or elders or deacons or staying as they are police officers where they are as the Lord has told them to do same thing with Roman soldiers I know that there was in the early church Roman soldiers who said you know we're Roman soldiers but God hasn't told us to leave so they didn't until the day when the Roman centurion said to the Roman soldier you see those Christians out there? Go kill them. And he said, no, but I will join them. And he took off his Roman epaulets and his, his clothing and all of his other stuff, you know, and walked out on the ice and died with the Christians. And it's a famous martyrdom story. The point is, God moves and uses us as he directs us, but he doesn't direct us to murder or to kill, per se. And be careful when you walk in the way that you think you should do because a lot of times you'll find yourself in conflict with what the Lord would have you to be. A witness you are to the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. The spiritual darkness of this world would make you into being a violent person. From the moment you were born in this generation, you were infused and confused and profused with tons of violence from television and from the world around you to become a violent person, a violent generation a violent nation because the generation that perished with Lot and with Noah was a violent generation every thought of them was towards violence we are in a generation of violence we're being prepared for that young people that will go to the Valley of Megiddo and die there are many, many, many nationalistic Christians idealisms that are out there to propagandize spiritual darkness so that you would think by volunteering to serve your country you're serving God. After all, we need to protect Israel, don't we? Really? Good luck with that one. <laughs> Sends two witnesses and what are you going to do? Lock them up? 
you know, Moses and Elijah probably are the two, and you're going to go to Israel to protect Israel because, you know, the commander in chief said, hey, you know, you go to Israel. You know, frankly, if I had, if somebody cut me orders for Israel, I'd hit the high road. Lock me up, fine. Put me in jail, prison, fine. But don't send me to Israel. <laughs> Guess what? Megiddo is close enough to Israel. I ain't going to be in the army and be in anywhere near Israel at any point in time. No, you wouldn't want to be there heading towards Jerusalem way. You wouldn't want to be there heading for your grave. It's an old song we used to sing in the Jesus movement. And you know what? I wouldn't want to be there heading for my grave. You know, because, put it bluntly, hey, what are you doing, really, in the army? You're just kind of trying to get something out of it, you know, because you really don't think that's going to be your life forever, do you? Really? You know, kind of like knowing the end times, the last days we're living in? Do you really want to be saluting when, quite frankly, you might be shooting those people that you're giving orders to take a life from? What if God said to you at the moment you were pulling the trigger, stop, witness, tell them about Jesus? Abraham had a very interesting challenge because he knew that God was it into people sacrifices but God made him go to the point of sacrificing his own son and in his own mind he had done it God examined his heart God knew what Abraham's intention was in the Hebrew it says almost like he was on the downstroke when he was stopped maybe that's true maybe he knew ahead of time some people like to say oh but he knew ahead of time okay some kind of trial that doesn't seem like much of a sacrifice. But as far as Abraham was concerned, the child was dead in his eyes. So, when we choose to obey, don't be surprised what God may say. We aren't called to be witnesses only to the things that we can see, but we are a testimony to the principalities, the sparrows, the spiritual wickedness, the darkness of this age, the angels unawares, all those things that we can't see, we are more of a testimony than we realize and a light shining in the darkness.